Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It is Monday, August the 28th, 2023, and in our divided times, there's one thing that both the left and right media agree on. My guest today is a big deal. According to the New York Times, a Harvard professor has become the world's leading alien hunter. The left-wing Guardian newspaper in England agrees. Uh, R.V. Loeb uh, says that UFOs should be the subject of mainstream inquiry. CNN, supposedly in the center, is also covering RV is a big deal. Um, he is the world's leading alien hunter. And the question is, has he found extraterrestrial life? The right agree as well. Uh, Fox News, uh, which most people who watch this show, I don't think agree with, um, believe that uh, the Harvard scientist has found alien life. Uh, and even the Daily Mail in England, which uh, has a uh, a special, uh, I think, expertise in the discovery of alien life believes that Avi Loeb has uh, perhaps found alien life. And I'm thrilled that Avi is coming back on the show. A couple of years ago, he was on talking about extraterrestrials. His best-selling book back then was Extraterrestrial, the first sign of intelligent life beyond Earth. Uh, Avi is uh, a man of enormous energy and independence and controversy and he has a new book out today interstellar the search for extraterrestrial life and our future in the stars and he's joining us from his home office in lexington massachusetts avi welcome and congratulations you're the man of the moment <laughs> well thank you um i woke up at 2 a.m uh, this morning just to make sure that the the scientific paper that will be publicized tomorrow uh, is uh, in perfect shape and it was a lot of work you know people have opinions on this subject and they just sit back and enjoy it but uh, doing the science is hard work we're going to get to the science in that paper but Avi, i wonder um i know your mother didn't always approve of, of what you're doing she may not even approve of it right now but um <laughs> if if these aliens can think for themselves what do you think they think of you do you think they think of you as a threat or a friend, this, this alien hunter. No oh. one really wants to be hunted, do they? Well, this is just a name that the New York Times uh, assigned to me. But the point is, they don't care about me. They don't care about us. We tend to think that everyone's <laughs> attention is focused on us. I think that, you know, the human species arrived uh, just a few million years ago. That's one part in 10,000 of the age of the universe. And uh, moreover, we are not at the center of the stage. We are, uh, you know, we are not at the center of the universe. We know that for four centuries now. Uh, so um, if you are not at the center of stage and you arrived late to the play, the play is not about you. And yeah. uh, you better seek other actors who can tell you what the play is about. So I think it's in our interest to learn about them and learn from them. Because if they arrive to our doorstep, before we arrive to their doorstep, they're much more advanced than we are. Yeah, it's a fascinating idea that they know more about what the origins of life in the universe than we do, do you think? Uh, it's not just life. It's the origin of the universe. In fact, that's my first question. If I ha ever uh, had a dialogue with a more intelligent uh, scientific uh, culture, I would ask them, what happened before the Big Bang? And one possibility, of course, is that uh, if they have a good understanding of how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity, something we don't have, uh, they could, uh, in principle, engineer quantum gravity to create a baby universe in their laboratories. So perhaps our own universe was created by scientists in white lab coats. And the, the way to think of it is just like we humans have babies that make babies as they become adults and those babies become adults again and make babies the same way you can imagine big bangs occurring one after the other as a result of scientists uh, living in those universes that are being created 
I'm not going to make any jokes, Avi, about big bangs and making babies, but maybe um, <laughs> M Mark Zuckerberg was right in, uh, in in betting his company on the metaverse. Are you suggesting that no. reality may somehow lie in the metaverse rather than what we take for granted? Of course. I mean, humans have these tendencies to imagine things and enjoy uh, their own uh, illusions. And that's what Mark Zuckerberg was uh, trying to benefit from. Uh, it, it's a situation where you put goggles on your head and you imagine that you are a celebrity. But the, the reality of the situation is that you are sitting at home and nobody cares about you because you put goggles and you detach yourself from reality. So I'm a scientist. I want us to get feedback from the reality we all share. And of course, a substitute to these goggles is also recreational drugs. I mean, you can do a lot of things. You can do string theory and imagine extra dimensions. I mean, the question is whether it describes reality. That's really the catch. And it's very easy to be surrounded by like-minded people and believe that, you know, you are in some virtual reality that gives you pleasure. But the truth is, you know, it's better to adapt to the reality we all share. That's the innovation that Galileo brought to the table when he said, we are not at the center of the universe, where everyone else wanted to believe that illusion. Do you think of yourself, in a sense, as a, another... Galileo, your your work is enormously controversial. You don't need me telling you that. Uh, I think the New York Times suggested, uh, in terms of your colleagues, to put it politely, they they don't trust you. Uh, uh, many, and I'm quoting the Times here, many in his own field consider Loeb a pariah. His more polite critics say that he is distracting from the horizon-expanding discoveries astronomers are making with new instruments like the web space telescope is there is this galileo 2.0 all these controversies are we? well i find it very strange because i'm actually doing the work of science i went to the pacific ocean a couple of months ago and uh, to collect materials about the first uh, recognized interstellar meteor and all that my colleagues uh, did was uh, push back and say nothing will come out of it and when I'm doing my work, collecting materials, bringing them back to Harvard and analyzing them and now reporting in a scientific paper, which is exactly the way science should be done, they only have negative things to say. Are they envious, do you think? I think so. I think it's jealousy that the public's attention is drawn to that. And one of them even said to the Harvard Crimson, it's about time that reporters pay attention to boring science. And I say... Why don't you do something that resonates with the public uh, rather than asking the reporters to pay attention to boring science? I guess it's more fun, this debate within Harvard than some of the other stuff on race and gender. But whenever you get reported on, you're always described as the Harvard professor. Does that annoy you? I mean, if you weren't a Harvard professor, your findings are just as legitimate. Right. I mean... Um, the way I see it, you know, uh, when a soccer player scores a goal, uh, the credit doesn't go to the team necessarily, but to the player. Uh, so I don't understand exactly this psychology. But um, uh, most importantly, you know, I, I adapted the approach of the eagle. Uh, very often an eagle has a crow on, on its back and the, the crow pecks at the neck of the eagle. And the solution the eagle finds is not to fight with the crow, but actually rise to greater heights where the oxygen level is lower so that the crow cannot survive and the crow drops off the back of the eagle. And for me, the greatest heights is doing science the way it should be done. And uh, for example, with this scientific paper that I led and is uh, submitted now for publication. Uh, so um, my hope is that when I do science correctly, eventually all the, these crows that are pecking on my neck will drop off because all I'm trying to do is follow the evidence, collect the evidence rather than have an opinion. How does this fit in, Avi? And I, I don't want to get to the book uh, Interstellar and, and, and your research and, and, and some of the, the claims you make in the book. Um, but how does this connect with the increasing politicization of science around? Last time we talked, we talked, I think, about COVID and science. The science become too politicized. The different camps are... I joked at the beginning that CNN and Fox and the New York Times and The Guardian all agree on you. It's the one thing they can agree on. What is it about science these days that's so divisive? I don't think it's uh, the science itself. I think it's the attitude 
of scientists which uh, do not follow the narrative, I mean, of their uh, job definition. Uh, they are being uh, motivated by ego-driven ambitions, you know, uh, uh, such as getting awards, recognition. They dance to the tunes of uh, some selection committees and uh, they always uh, gets, get their pride out of past knowledge. And uh, you're a beneficiary of that system too. You've risen up through the ranks. Yes. But, you know, Picasso, uh, when he started his career, uh, he uh, was very realistic in his paintings. And his idea was that he needs to reproduce the traditional approach uh, and then branch out uh, to, you know, cubism, wh where he innovated and deviated from uh, what was uh, practiced before him. And that's the nature of innovation, you see. And uh, you see innovation right now in uh, the private sector quite often, not so much in academia, because there is this, uh, you know, peer pressure and bullying going on, on anyone that deviates from the beaten path. And I'm using my work as a teaching moment. I'm also trying to educate my colleagues in academia that there is a better way. You mentioned Picasso. We're going to do a show on him uh, next month on a, uh, a very popular biography of him. Has that been your strategy? Did you always think that you had to do things conventionally, to do things unconventionally, to get to your quote-unquote cubist moment? <laughs> well, it's, it's sort of obvious the way the system is built. To get tenure, you know, it requires a huge amount of effort. The person uh, before me that got tenured from within at Harvard was 15 years earlier. So I had to work really hard. And even though I worked on the first st stars and galaxies before they were recognized, now the Webb Telescope is pioneering uh, observations related to the field that I started basically with my work two, two decades ago. I, I wrote two textbooks on it, uh, but I had to convince uh, many selection committees to provide me with tenure, with the, the kind of uh, stature and position that I have. But uh, when both my parents passed away, I realized, you know, we, li we live for such a short time. Let's uh, focus on substance. I don't care how many likes I get. I just want to do the right thing. And if others have a problem with that, so be it. That's the whole purpose of tenure in academia, that you are able to uh, go along what appears to you as common sense when it's not common. And uh, you don't risk your job because of that. You mentioned your parents both being dead. The New York Times piece touches on your mom. Tell me a little bit about her. Uh, you, you say... Um... You describe your mother as an interrupted intellectual who, whose family pulled her from college in Bulgaria to move to Israel on its founding. What do you think your mother would think of all this? Well, uh, she, I had a very strong connection with her. Um, she was an intellectual, and um, much of my philosophical thinking came from uh, my conversations with her. Uh, the one thing I wanted to mention is uh, there is actually a playwright uh, from Los Angeles who wrote a play that he wants to bring to Broadway about my career. And one of the narratives in the play uh, deals with my relationship with my mother. And, and uh, you know, a part of uh, innovation is not just about creating new content within your discipline. It's also deviating from uh, the approval process or the psychology of your parents, which uh, I did. Uh, in this context. And it seems to me like such an important subject that could affect the future of humanity that I just cannot give up on it uh, to please my colleagues because, uh, you know, that, that's what the public really cares about. And uh, now the government, there was a hearing in the House of Representatives where the word the extraterrestrial was mentioned multiple times. Uh, so if that's of interest to the public and government, you know, it's our civil duty as scientists to do that. But as I said, common sense is not common. I'm trying to make it common. Are we alone? You mentioned that uh, Schumer, a Democrat, and Mike Rounds, a Republican, putting forth an amendment on whether or not we're alone. Uh, we're talking with a man who has some very uh, interesting assumptions on whether or not we're alone. He's the author of Extraterrestrial, um, and uh, Interstellar, the new book, The Search for Extraterrestrial Life and Our Future in the Stars. Uh, he doesn't need much of an introduction from me. Avi Loeb is a, a scientific superstar. He's the Galileo of our age, perhaps. Avi, <laughs> we can take a quick break. 
Uh, I want to mention uh, our sponsor, Liberties Quarterly. You're going to get an annual subscription uh, uh, because I think guys like you need to be reading this thing. We're going to run a short ad and then we'll be back with RB talking specifically about Interstellar. Don't go away, anyone. Beyond the news, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties, it's not just, it's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. You can check out Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. We are talking with Avi Loeb, uh, who has a new book out tomorrow, Interstellar. The search for extra extraterrestrial life and our future in the stars. It's certainly uh, already getting many headlines. Uh, Avi, tell me a little bit more about the book. What assumptions is it built on? Uh, something to do with a, 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 a meteor falling under the Pacific in, in 2014? Is this the beginnings of all this? Well, the, the punchline of uh, the meteor expedition that I'll mention in a few minutes is the title of this book. And uh, we will uh, discuss it in a press release uh, uh, on uh, the 29th of August, tomorrow, uh, the same date as the publication uh, date of my book. And my book, Interstellar, is mostly about the implications for humanity. Uh, if we find a technological gadget from another technological civilization far away, what could it do to, uh, to us? And, of course, it will uh, bring us to a better place. That's my expectation, because we will learn about our own uh, technological future from their technological past if they preceded us by billions of years. But it might also give us a, a different perspective instead of us fighting with each other, engaging in conflicts on this rock that we call uh, our home, Earth. Uh, we would realize that we are all in the same boat, you know, the same feeling I had during the expedition. We're all in the same boat. We better work together and explore space together rather than fight each other. So what was this expedition about? Uh, there was a meteor uh, that was uh, spotted by US government satellites back in 2014, uh, about a decade ago, uh, over the Pacific Ocean, about uh, 85 uh, kilometers away from uh, Manus Island uh, in Papua New Guinea. And uh, um, I, together with my student, uh, undergraduate student Amir Siraj realized that this object was moving so fast that it must have been unbound to the sun's gravity. It came from outside the solar system. Unlike the planets that keep moving around the sun, they're bound. Um, so this was the first interstellar object recognized. And uh, uh, the U.S. Space Command issued a formal letter to NASA uh, basically confirming that this object is interstellar uh, and at the 99.999% confidence after our paper was written. And uh, then at that point, I decided to lead an expedition that will go to the crash site of this meteor. And How did you find finance the expedition? It must have been expensive. Well, I just announced it and said I need the one and a half million dollars. And then within a few months, uh, I had a Zoom call with uh, Charles Hoskinson, who said, you have the money. I didn't no, no conditions. You just had the money. Do whatever you like with it. Yes, no strings attached. So uh, I, I basically assembled a team of exceptional uh, professionals uh, who are very, you know, are the best in the world in ocean expeditions, uh, and uh, they engineered a sled that you see in this picture, which has uh, magnets on both sides, and we connected the sled to a ship that was fittingly called the Silver Star. And uh, uh, we dragged the sled on the ocean floor and collected magnetic particles. The region was seven miles in size and the ocean depth was more than a mile. So we were looking for millimeter sized particles, the size of a grain of sand on the ocean floor that melted off. These are droplets that melted off the surface of the object when it was exposed to the immense heat from the fireball generated as the object moved through air. And uh, amazingly enough, we found them 
we found all together about uh, 700 of those spherules. They look like metallic marbles. Uh, and uh, we found them first on the ship, but then found many more at Harvard. And so, so the assumption that that uh, an object from space crashed into the ocean, is that the foundations of this? Yeah. So what was amazing about the, this object is not only it was moving fast relative to the escape speed from the solar system, but outside the solar system, it was moving faster than 95% of the stars in the vicinity of the sun. And moreover, it had material strength tougher than all the space rocks, 272 of them, that were cataloged by NASA over the past decade. So that raised the possibility that it may be a Voyager like meteor. Imagine Voyager leaving the solar system and then colliding with another planet like the Earth. It would appear like a meteor in the sky of that planet uh, of unusual uh, material strength because it's made of uh, stainless steel and it would move faster than usual because it benefited from artificial propulsion. So that's what we were set to find. We analyzed those ferals, a uh, tenth of them, uh, at Harvard with the best instrument that the world has to offer, a mass spectrometer in the laboratory of uh, uh, Stein Jacobson. And uh, we found uh, that uh, we have a completely independent proof that this object came from outside the solar system has to do with its composition, not with its speed. So now we know for sure that we have... You know for sure that it came from another solar... It came from outside... Outside the solar system, and uh, based on the composition. And I cannot give more details. They will come out tomorrow. But um, basically, we, um, we see an abundance of elements. Is that a big deal, uh, Avi? I mean, could it, is it yeah. conceivable that a meteor could have come from outside our solar system? It's a big deal because it's the first time that humans hold materials from a large object that came from outside the solar system. The first time in history. And never before scientists, you know, found or analyzed materials from a large object bigger than half a meter that came from outside the solar system. Some so of your, some of your quote unquote colleagues, as you know, believe you may, and I'm quoting from a, an Engadget piece, you may have done the science wrong. Is your science watertight, so to speak, Avi, on all this? Well, we just wrote the paper, the scientific. They are talking without, first of all, they haven't had the access to the materials, uh, you know, and second, they were not involved in the scientific work that we did over the past two months. And so how can they make a comment about it? It's, they are, they are, it just shows you that they, are, they have a, a, a completely different um, um, motivation in saying these things because they should have just waited until we put the scientific paper out and then it's not necessarily bad for you your book comes out tomorrow some people might think this is a bit of a stunt his book comes out tomorrow he's releasing a white paper tomorrow at the same it's time it's not a so white paper it's a scientific paper well it's sorry, a paper I, I meant a scientific paper, paper is yeah but uh, but actually we plan to submit this paper weeks ago it just took us longer to do the analysis and as I said, uh, I woke up at 2 a.m. this morning just to make it uh, ready. And uh, it was a lot of work. It's not uh, something you just pull out of a hat. But it's a coincidence that the paper, the scientific paper and the book are coming out on the same day? Yes, complete coincidence. Like these aliens finding us, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you see, the, um, obviously with the spherules, these tiny particles, we can't... Uh, show whether it's technological in origin, this object, or uh, natural. But uh, what we are aiming to is uh, uh, the next uh, expedition uh, that may find bigger pieces because, you know, a, a, a piece of a rock or a piece of a gadget can easily be distinguished because a gadget may have some buttons on it. We live in an age, Avi, you don't need me to tell you, where there is increasing preoccupation with these issues is that coincidental as the science and you know the science as well as anyone um begins to focus on it what comes first it seems a bit of a chicken and egg situation well the scientific funny. investigations or the public perception on this or the movies and the books and all the hysteria around it well i can give you the perspective uh, of an astronomer so uh, only over the past decade we had a survey telescope like pan stars uh, that monitored the sky uh, in Hawaii and was looking for near-Earth 
objects, and that allowed um, us to detect uh, Oumuamua, a football-sized uh, object that uh, came from outside the solar system. And the meteor was a result mm -hmm. of... And for uh, people watching, here we have a, an image, uh, a 3D-printed model of Oumuamua. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, just a piece of art, so to speak, uh, that I got as a gift. Uh, but, uh, in, in, you know, and the government uh, satellites uh, that are monitoring the Earth, so, you know, they were not put in place more than a decade ago. So it, there were, uh, I mean, technological advances that allow us to see uh, those interstellar objects for the first time in history. And when Enrico Fermi asked, where is everybody? He didn't actually seek the evidence. He was just sitting in Los Alamos, speaking with friends. And, you know, that's a very presumptuous statement to make. You need to dedicate effort to look for the evidence. That's, you know, nobody imagined that gravitational waves will fall into our lap without building LIGO that discovered them in 2015, the first source. So uh, it, it requires hard work and investment of funds. We, you know, uh, extraordinary evidence require extraordinary funding. And uh, we just need to decide about priorities. And for me... Uh, listening to the interests of the public is a priority. Some people might argue, let sleeping dogs lie. You mentioned Enrico Fermi. That name will, may ring a bell for non-scientists because he was featured um, in the Oppenheimer movie. Right. Uh, physicists are now big business, superstars. The Oppenheimer movie with Barbie has done very well. <laughs> Is By the way, uh, uh, the uh, maybe, maybe, Avi, one day they will make a film called Loeb. Um, is there any concern in all seriousness that you are disturbing a sleeping dog and you should just leave this stuff alone because one day it's going to come back quite literally to bite us as a species? Well, first of all, I should tell you that they are making now, right now, for months, a film about me. Oh, they are? I hope it's going to be okay. called Loeb, is it? Um, or Avi? Uh, <laughs> well, it will be quite realistic. But um, uh, the other thing, um, you know... Uh, I just want to figure out, you know, what reality we live in, which is pretty much the goal of physics and science more broadly, because we need to adapt to it. It doesn't make sense for us to imagine that we are alone when we have a neighbor. I mean, it's better for us to know that we have a neighbor. Uh, and uh, I don't care how much of a psychological shock that will give. To yeah, but we don't people. want to alert the neighbor. I guess you're suggesting the neighbor already knows we're around, so it won't be news to them. No, not necessarily, because maybe the objects, the first objects we saw are just uh, space trash, you know, just like plastics in the ocean. The, you know, there were over the billions of years of history of the Milky Way galaxy, there were lots of... Uh, civilizations that rose and fell, you know, that are dead by now, but they sent uh, technological equipment to space, which is now just space junk, uh, trash. And every now and then such an object comes close to Earth or collides with Earth. That may be what we are seeing. I didn't say that they are spying on us. How, did you see the Oppenheimer movie? I'm sure you did. Yes, I loved it. And I should say that the Enrico Fermi, I think, is the key to the success of the Manhattan Project, because as a young kid, you know, I read the uh, many of his writings. He, he was both an experimentalist and a theorist, uh, one of these rare combinations. And whenever I read him, it was clear that he has a very good uh, uh, intuition about how to do physics. He built the first nuclear reactor at the University of Chicago. I think he was key to the success of the Manhattan Project. Seems the two, uh, Fermi is an important character, but the two key characters from a ethical scientific point of view in the movie are Oppenheimer and Edward Teller. Um, what, what did you make of that? And what's your take uh, on Oppenheimer's moral ambivalence about uh, yeah. the weapon he developed, the technology he developed, versus Teller, who was gung-ho on developing um, as, as, as many weapons as he possibly can at, could out right. of this technology? No, I think Oppenheimer was naive to imagine that he would have any say about how to use the atomic weapon that he developed. And he should have gotten into it with a clear recognition that it, this would be the case, that the, the minute the, the bombs leave uh, Los Alamos, they will be in the hands of politicians. He should have recognized that from the beginning. And the fact that he didn't, that he was shocked about it and felt bad about it, Im implies that he was not 
very realistic. There is another uh, example for a, a situation where he was not realistic. He did the, one of the most uh, important works of his careers about the collapse of stars to black holes. And uh, that was work uh, that is celebrated still. Uh, but he regarded that as phenomenology. He thought that astrophysics is applied science. And he always wanted to be regarded as a particle theorist, particle physicist, as if that's more prestigious. But nobody remembers his contributions to particle physics as much as his contribution to the uh, you know, foundation of uh, uh, astrophysical black holes. And that's the ironic uh, 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 reflection on, uh, you know, if you deal with reality on something that is realized rather than is theoretical, uh, you know, you make much more of a difference. And that's, you know, the approach I'm trying to take that, you know, trying to learn the reality that we live in, not talk about extra dimensions that we might never be able to see. Does your work, is your work and your science, is it dependent on Einstein? Einstein, of course, comes out of the movie in a in an unsurprisingly heroic way, we've done some shows on Einstein in the past. There's the the every man who has moved beyond science. What right. did you make of Einstein, and what do you in Oppenheimer, and and what's your take on on the worship of Einstein in our culture today? Well, I think he was very wise. Uh, uh, towards when he was at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, he made three mistakes actually between 19. 35 and 1940. One of them is to say that black holes do not exist uh, because he was, uh, he had a conflict with Oppenheimer. And, and as, as I said, one of Oppenheimer's important contributions was to predict black holes. So Einstein tried to argue that they don't exist because Oppenheimer's uh, work assumed the collapse to a point uh, in a spherically symmetric fashion. And Einstein said, no, stars spin. And because of their spin, they will be prevented from collapsing to black holes. Therefore, black holes do not exist. So he was wrong about that. And then uh, he also said that quantum mechanics doesn't have spooky action at a distance. He was wrong about that as well. And then he wrote a paper with his postdoc, uh, Nathan uh, Rosen, saying that gravitational waves do not exist. And he was wrong about that as well. And actually, all three uh, were proven uh, wrong by some experimental teams that received the Nobel Prize in Physics over the past six years. And it just shows you that many times at the frontier of science, you don't know what is right and what is wrong. Uh, and therefore, we should be open-minded and modest. Uh, now, in terms of the relationship with Oppenheimer, you know, Oppenheimer was much more of a politician. You can tell that. And when he came to Princeton, he was the director. Uh, it was a managerial uh, position. And uh, Einstein was more of a thinker. Uh, and he was right, actually. He, taught, he gave advice to Oppenheimer that was right on the spot. Um, so they had some rivalry between them. And uh, Oppenheimer commented in one of the exchanges about Einstein being uh, the old fool. Um, they didn't like each other. Um, uh, and um, unfortunately, you know, that's part of academia. Uh, I think both of them made important contributions uh, and should be celebrated in different ways. Although I think... Uh... Einstein comes out of the movie at least better than Oppenheimer, and you perhaps suggest that the greater the scientists, perhaps the greater their mistakes. Uh, even Einstein was capable of making major mistakes. Oh, Have yeah. you ever made a mistake? Definitely. The reason I got interested in Oumuamua was because a decade earlier, uh, I wrote a paper that predicted that we will not see uh, such uh, ro will not see rocks with the Pan Star Telescope in Hawaii from other stars. And uh, we said they will find nothing. And then they found Oumuamua. It's a near-Earth object. And that was a surprise to me. And the question is, why was I wrong about imagining no such uh, detections? And, you know, uh, one possibility is that there are many more rocks than we expected based on the solar system by a factor of 100 uh, to 100 million. And the second possibility is that they are not rocks. <laughs> they are technological in origin. Well, finally, uh, one of the more intriguing uh, things that you suggest um, that you believe that if there is such a thing as an ex extraterrestrial, uh, which comes out of your, your two last books, that maybe they will make contact with AI first rather than humans. Of course, scientists now are obsessed with AI. It's the new 
Uh, it's the new um, nuclear issue. Uh, Christopher Nolan, who directed um, Oppenheimer, suggested that the story now applies directly to AI. Were you being speculative, amusing, Avi? Are you serious? Do you think if, if there is um, extraterrestrial life out there, are they more likely to make contact with our AIs than they are with us, you or I? Well, yeah, because, um, you know, right now we have the Perseverance rover and the helicopter ingenuity that are being managed by engineers in the Jet Propulsion Lab of NASA. Uh, and, uh, you know, I call that... Um, uh, helicopter parenting because uh, I mean not only they are parenting a helicopter but they are actually helicopter parenting they're telling those devices what to do these robots but uh, that cannot work across interstellar distances because it takes uh, you know thousands of years even for a signal of light to traverse the Milky Way galaxy so you know you can't have the probe waiting for guidance it needs to be autonomous it needs to have its own brain and the way to do that is to equip it with artificial intelligence. And we haven't yet launched AI systems to space, but it's clear that that would be the future if we want to go interstellar. And I imagine that as being AI astronauts. I talk about it in my book quite extensively. Well, finally, uh, Avi, uh, Interstellar, your new book's out tomorrow with your scientific paper, The Search for Extraterrestrial Life and Our Future in the Stars. If there are... If there is extraterrestrial life out there, maybe they'd be called Stella and they're watching. What would you say to them finally? Oh, I would uh, say uh, what was there before the Big Bang. And by the way, don't give up on us. We can do better. Uh, and the third thing I would say is where is the nearest? Are we that bad? I mean, we're not that bad, are we? Uh, it depends how uh, high. I mean, scared. the one thing I can tell you, I guarantee you about any extraterrestrial life out there is they couldn't give a damn about what happens amongst academics at Harvard. <laughs> That's right. And I am trying to ignore that as well. Uh, but my point is that, you know, we can do better. We can focus on things that are more important, on substance. And, you know, there is so much real estate above us that we ignore. So let's uh, get our priorities right. And um, that's my uh, advice to humanity. And I hope that the wake-up call from finding a gadget uh, would be just that, so that we will start uh, working together with each other because we are all in the same boat.